was given all that we had heard, trying to synthesize some of our plans for design safe, some of the things we're hearing that you need, how we're going to fulfill those. But it also became clear because we're such a diverse community here, some folks were not fully aware of all the things that are available today in design safe. So I'm going to go through a quick overview of some of the things uh, we have today and then the plans that we have to, to work on over the next few years in particular that facilitate AI, machine learning and, and deep learning. So just to be clear, Design Safe has a vision to not just be a data repository, but to be a part of the research process. Uh, and we do that by, 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 of course, providing a data repository and a platform for data sharing and publishing. But also we want to enable your research workflows in the cloud in Design Safe. Uh, which also means having access to high performance computing um, and we've got cloud based tools that help you do various parts of your work. So when you look at when you when you visit design safe and you go to the research research workbench in the up, upper uh, Panel there you'll see the data depot that's our data repository the workspace and the reconnaissance portal as well as other NERI information and partners information from the sim center with respect to their research tools and then our user guides. Um, when we think, when we look at the data depot for Design Safe, it actually has multiple levels of access. So you, can, you have a private space that's just you. No one else has access to it. It's called My Data. When you want to then start collaborating with a group, you can create a project and add members to it. So that represents a collaboration space for just data sharing among your group. But that is the mechanism to ultimately publish your data. When you do publish a project, a data from a project, it, it ends up in the published section, and that's where the curated data resides. Uh, and then we do have this area called community data. We kind of consider it the wild, wild west. It's uh, just a disorganized data, but it's there and it's available. So it's uncurated. So as I mentioned, the workspace is where the tools reside. And then the reconnaissance portal, which is very specific um, is re to reconnaissance, is one mechanism to find data uh, related to different reconnaissance uh, activities and natural hazards events. So just to give you a quick look, this is what the data depot looks like. If you, once you log in, uh, you can see my projects. These are projects that I'm all members of. Um, we can link to your typical cloud service providers. If you're using Box, Dropbox, or Google Drive, so you can move files back and forth directly. Um, and I like to think of this as a place to share your files with your collaborators and eventually at some point publish for public use. And that's where you go into the publish section. Um, a couple of comments, because we heard about organized data, disorganized data, semi-organized data. We have a certain philosophy is that we provide what we consider structured yet flexible data models. So there's five basic data models indicated here for experiments simulation. So we, we just heard someone say should we should be publishing simulation data. We can do that. Hybrid simulation, field research, which includes reconnaissance. And then if it, you don't fit any of the first four boxes, use other because that's what everything else is. Um, but with flexibility comes responsibility. So we have some minimum metadata, um, but it's the responsibility of the researcher to fully document um, their research and their data for others to ultimately use. So here's just an example of a, a project uh, uh, published by Scott Brandenburg, uh, centrifuge testing. You've got you know, written text and ultimately going down, you end up with the different files, et cetera. And importantly, and this is a one maybe carrot related to what we were talking about a second ago, is every data set that's published gets a DOI. And that's not just so you, know, you can have a DOI, the key is when you write a paper that uses that data, even if you created that data, put the DOI and this reference in your, in your reference list, not in the acknowledgments, not in the text. It's a citation, just like a paper citation. A data citation is like a paper citation. We try and help you. You can copy and paste that and put it in your reference list. Uh, and then, you know, here's the published data sets and you can search and whatnot. And, and that's where you identify the, data, the published data sets. So, yeah, question. So the data that we can post uh, should also come from NSF. Ah, great question. 
we don't care any data. We've got data from New Zealand. We've got data from other countries. We've got data funded not necessarily by NSF. Anything. And I, yeah. Thank you. There are some limits on size yeah. for non NSF data, but you know, yeah. above, above many terabytes, excuse me, call it, if you want to publish a terabyte data set, uh, and if not an NSF data, the one that's very expensive. What's the limit time within uh, so once you publish a project, you can go back and add to modify it? Uh, that is. So, yeah, it's. <laughs> we have plans. Yeah, so we are a versioning system in there so you can put in new versions but the idea of publishing a data set is like publishing a journal article right once because once that data sits out there and people refer to it to make anything reproducible you need to be able to refer to the version that you first saw right so yeah if it was out in a printed journal you would never expect to say i want to go pretend that never happened and change it, it right you have to publish a, an update an erratum right? or if there's and so a published data set should be treated the same way right once it's published and there's a DOI to it, you should always be able to go back and find that original data set um, that was there the day you pointed at it. You shouldn't go to five years later to find it completely different. So, um, so what you can do is publish new versions. Um, and right now, you work with Maria directly to do something like that. She's sitting over there, Maria Esteva. Maria Esteva is our data, data curator. Data but, uh, um, the, uh, but yeah, Sumo will have an automated system, so you can just create a 1.1 and a 1.2 version, but the DOI will actually. So I have a follow-up there. So, so once I publish a data, yeah. that's sort of separate, but I also publish sort of uh, the results on the project that included the preliminary data set included models, yep. included references, things like that. And I also couldn't, once I published that, I couldn't modify it. So the data set I understand. Right. But something like that, it seems like it could be a little bit more flexible. So, yeah. So. There is a whole notion around what a publication means and what needs to be published. So the idea here is once you actually publish it and somebody refers to it, it should essentially be archival, right? You should be able to go back and find that version. If you want to share something that you know might get modified a hundred times, right? Here's the current working set of whatever. That's what the community data space is for, right? So you can push stuff out there that is not curated, right? It's not archival, but you still can share it with everybody publicly. And it won't have a DOI. But, and it's not automated to get it in community data, but we can work with you on that. Yeah, so, I mean. But that's it, archive, it's DOI, it's right? So. Final report, you know, same thing, right? If you publish a new version of the report, you should publish it. Just like, you know, think of it like publishing a journal, right? Once the physical journal is printed, you know, it's there and it exists, and all you can do is publish revisions to it, right? So, um, so when you think about a publication, that's how we want you to think about it. It's, you know, permanent sort of archival record. Um, but community data is for things that you want to share or pre publication. Right. So. Laura. I'm okay with that. I assume that if somebody goes back to version zero, that there will be a note that there is a version one of this. And yes. Go there. yes. There will be some notes that say what I've done to version one is zero. So right. it's yes. pretty yeah. easy to get. Yeah, and on the publication screen, it'll be like looking at deprecated NSF solicitations, right? You know, you go find them. Oh, this one isn't current anymore. Go find this new one. But the old one's still all there, right? So, so when you have to have the argument about, no, no, you sent this solicitation. I didn't have to do this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but the original one is still there, not the new one. And so now you have to do four more things. So, I don't have that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any any other questions on this? This is great. Great discussion. Because we're always looking for good feedback and questions like that. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the workspace. So this is where the tools reside. It's a subset of tools. There are other tools that are available only at the command line. Um, so you can see they're split up between simulation, visualization, data processing, partner data apps, and some utilities. We also have some private apps if you're working with us to develop them. Um, so, so these are cloud-based tools that run on our server. Some of them are HPC enabled, running on Stampede 2, ultimately, perhaps Frontera for some of them. Some of the example tools that are, are, are simulation codes that are available, OpenSeas, LSDyna, AdCirc, Swan, OpenFoam, uh, as well as others. And as I mentioned, some are available, all of those are available at the command line um, with easy access. Uh, and then we can provide easy access to uh, an HPC allocation. <laughs> Tim mentioned that at the end of the day yesterday. 
I wanted to uh, focus a little bit on Jupiter because it's so important to what we are, so, so integral to some of our future plans. So we do have MATLAB available because a lot of people are familiar with MATLAB. And I remember with Nice and Shirley, can, so many people wanted us to get MATLAB in there and that, because that's what they use. So we, we've been able to do that. It's still a commercial code. Uh, Jupiter is, um, is open source. So it's that electronic notebook that we all have been promised for so long. Uh, supports Python as well as many other languages. And we'll talk, well, I'm going to show you some examples of how we're using it. Um, in terms of visualization, we have things, we have our own tool called PazMapper, um, which I'll talk a little bit about. Poetry for looking at cloud point, uh, point cloud data, uh, open source GIS, QGIS, and then some um, uh, tools that are specific to AdSerc, uh, Calcana and, and Figurative. But just to give you an idea of what some of the things that we're doing with Jupyter and our users are doing with Jupyter, an electronic notebook to data. So this is an electronic do, uh, notebook uh, associated with a published data set where you can, you know, it can look like rich text, but there's the code is in there too. Uh, and here you can actually look at some time series. You can zoom in, you can output. You see you've got the drawing down here. The drawing down here uh, has all the sensors labeled. Again, responsibility. This means a researcher has to do a little bit of work if they want to publish it this way. So we're not going to require this, but we enable it. Uh, and that was done by Scott Brandenburg at UCLA. Um, something that we, we did uh, was some um, numerical methods we had developed, but we didn't have a tool that people could uh, use to actually do the analysis and practice for seismic slope stability. So we uh, incorporated it into a Jupyter notebook where in fact, this uses the API for the USGS. So it, it requires ground motion hazard information from the USGS. You put the lat launch here, it uses the USGS API, pulls all the hazard data automatically over to design safe to do the subsequent data analysis to ultimately develop your displacement hazard curve. So um, now of course, USGS changed their API. So we did have to go in and publish a revision um, uh, for, our, for, our, for our tool. <laughs> uh, this is what the reconnaissance portal looks like. Um, there's been a lot of events. So each of these pins represent an event where there is a published data set. So you can either, you know, zoom into a pin, then uh, it'll pop up on the left side and you'll see the published data sets as well as links to data sets that are outside design safe. So it's not only for design safe data sets. So for instance, here for the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016, you zoom in, here are the data sets that are available. Uh, and in this case, then you could look, for instance, the landside inventory we developed using satellite imagery is available here. Uh, you can open it in HazMapper. And here in HazMapper, we've got some of the, slowly, some of the images that we took, um, some of the, lands, the, all the landslides we identified, and some of the, geo, uh, the track logs um, from our GPS, all in one place. We're, we're lo looking to um, release has Mapper 2.0 and uh, very soon it'll have a lot more advanced capabilities to bring all these different data sets together. Uh, another type of data that tends to be large is hard to email back and forth is point cloud data. So uh, we have the po Poetry point cloud viewer so you can convert your last files into a Poetry file, run the viewer, and then this you're running in the cloud and you can do your measurements and analysis there. Um, and again, we're gonna have the Has Mapper 2.0 you'll have an, uh, a point where you said, look, I took uh, LIDAR data here, click on the link and the Poetry Viewer will pop up and be able to, to start looking at the data. And then just to, to be uh, consistent here, I wanna show, so that, there's the data set. This is a data set in Design Safe. There's the citation, Olson et al, as well as uh, the DOI. Our learning center, which you get to from the top bar again, has a lot of information on webinars, not only our webinars, Sim Center webinars, others. Uh, if you're interested in giving a webinar and some of your research, we'd be happy to host that as well. Uh, we've got our user guides and we've got documentation in almost every screen uh, if you look for the blue links. So what are the, some of the things that we have planned for in the next uh, few years to facilitate AI in particular? So of course, we've already talked about data sets. So uh, one thing I want to make sure people understood from today is data sets exist in design safe that can be used for machine learning. Uh, we heard Shirley's data set is up there. 
um, steer, gear, all the ears are, are publishing their data here in Design Safe. Simulation data is available, experimental data, all the NIST data going back to the very beginning. Uh, and in fact, we're consider we're looking at uh, assigning DOIs to all the NIST data from before we started it. We started that during the NIST process, but we're, there's still a lot of NIST data that doesn't have DOIs. Jupiter is something that we're really going to be emphasizing um, over the next uh, few years. And we'll have containers specifically devoted for AI applications. Now you don't need HPC necessarily, so we'll have Jupyter running on virtual machines if you only really need, you know, simple horsepower, but we will have specific containers set up to run HPC. And I'll show you an example from the boot camp on Monday. Um, and here we can use Jupyter as a workflow engine to access Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, all the different algorithms and, and tools and, and platforms that are out there. In terms of education, which is also something y'all mentioned, uh, we want to have as many examples, trainings, uh, published use cases as possible. And one way um, we, we also want to engage the community is to starting the Design Safe Cyber Infrastructure Institute, which would be kind of like the summer camp idea we heard several people talk about. So uh, you would fund your students to come here. We'd have groups of you know, maybe 10 or 15 students working together with each other, interacting with each other, but having access to the tax staff who we have AI people, we have HPC people. This is beyond just AI, but um, people who want to take advantage of the resources we have available uh, here. So I wanted to finish up with just showing that what you could do today, and in fact, actually you could do it two days ago, it Monday at the boot camp. So um, Mayar Sharifi, who's in the back, who works at TAC, but is, has a PhD in civil engineering, um, we found it's really important to have some folks like that uh, embedded here at TAC. So he took Harvey residential damage data that was published by Steer in DesignSafe. There are about, if I forgot to check, it's about 800 or so entries. So for each building, they have lots of pictures, several pictures. And then the damage state, the age, the roof type, this, that, the other, <clears throat> wind speed, et cetera. And we did two use cases. One, where we used decision trees and random forest classifiers to train a model that would predict damage state from the input variables. It used Jupyter, Python, Sky, really scikit-learn, uh, embedded in Jupyter, just running on a virtual machine. Use case two, use those images that were associated with each of those buildings to train a neural network that classifies damage from images. This again also worked in Jupyter, but a specific Jupyter instance, it's in a container on Frontera um, and use Keras and TensorFlow. And all, if you wanna do these use cases, the notebooks, everything, the, the slideshow that gives you step-by-step -step, uh, how to do it, is all in community data. I showed you that yesterday. Um, slides there. This is the one I wanted to show. Ah, oh, that's why. So there. This is in community data, machine learning bootcamp. Everything you need is there. And just to quickly show you what that looks like. So here's uh, the Harvey Field Reconnaissance data by David Roosh et al. Uh, with the DOI. Um, so there's the published data set. Now, I will acknowledge the published data set represented basically a CSV file. For each row was a different entry. And then, and then there were like links, not even links, they were just the file names for the photos. Okay, so Maillard had to do a little work. He had to clean some stuff up. He wrote a Jupyter notebook, I believe, that cleaned things up. Um, he, and it linked the file names to each of the entries in the uh, database. Um, this just shows you in HazMapper where all the images were collected, the residential images. So here's the CSV file, okay? And they were given, here's the damage scale, et cetera. Um, and then there's a Jupyter notebook that will then do uh, a classification uh, using random forests. Um, using, we got that independent and uh, dependent variables. And again, the second version, which again, is a different Jupyter notebook. It runs on a different Jupyter uh, instance, but it, all clear in the, in, the, in the slideshow. 
does image plasticity. So you can play around with it. And what we want to do with these use cases is provide not only slides of, look, we did it, we will give you the Jupyter Notebook so you can build off of those with your own students. So Dan, do you want to add anything to this? Uh, are we going to still do the wrap up discussion or are you just going to say thanks? No, I, I'm saying uh, I wanted this to kind of initiate the discussion and questions that we may have. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, before we get into the discussion, because I feel like we're going to bleed people as soon as we say stop. I know. <laughs> The one serious thing I want to say is thank you for taking the time to come here. Um, you know, computer time is relatively cheap. Your time is extremely valuable. Um, and taking a couple of days with us, uh, you know, so many of these things, but I know how much effort it takes to come to one of these. I can really do appreciate it. And, you know, we're synthesizing all the stuff into a report and I guarantee it will actually get used. So if something will happen, in terms of what we build and design, say the feedback we give to NSF and the requirements and some other reports. Um, so everything you've done will be awesome. Yeah, you know, hopefully it was useful to you personally to be here, but it's certainly useful to us. And we, uh, you know, we will make sure that your time is well spent on this. So thanks so much for taking the time and giving us your input on it. Um, in small rewards, um, rather than making you just tag images before you leave, um, <laughs> uh, method, uh, since several people asked about it. <laughs> I mean, about these, um, I do have a slide in the back of the Pack Taco stickers, <laughs> the handy design safe stickers, which you would ask about if people's left off, and a few of my other computer super stickers with my staff. I don't have this one. which looks like this. It looks like Taco, anyways. So we got tired of explaining it and just made the Taco stickers. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some up here, there's some on the back table. If you'd like to just wrap some before you leave. And it says built for bites. I think that's. Yeah, we have Google. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, and then we can. Yeah, so I, I just like to open it up. Any last minute up. questions, comments, thoughts yeah, around the room? There are things that we missed that we should have talked about. Um, yeah, there was a bunch of themes that clearly come out, but uh, if there's stuff that we've missed or stuff you'd like to emphasize one more time, uh, if it was in the working group reports, we've got it. So. Yeah. <laughs> Quick question about the interesting uh, visual art that you mentioned. Do you know uh, if all the drone on the road uh, to our So it's an evolving uh, field, all right? So Five years ago, when I tried to reference a data set with a DOI, they went in and they changed the DOI to a URL. And I didn't catch it because it wasn't actually even an author query at the end. They just changed it. And it was like two years later, I was like, oh, let me see that DOI. And I realized it. Now, that was five years ago. I found that they're much um, better now. I would still always look at your references before you accept the paper proof. Um, and what, what's also encouraging is the Journal of Structural Engineer. Well, all of ASCE now is, is encouraging people to data availability statements, et cetera, or data and links. Um, Earthquake Spectra, we've had data papers now for, again, five or six years. The Journal of Structural Engineering, ASCE, is, is initiating something similar. So I think the idea of data publishing is really becoming a lot more pervasive. And yes, you can do a data supplement to a journal, you know, to a paper, but some of these data sets are really too large to, to do that. And that's why well, that's the service we can provide. Yeah. How long does it take for the project to submit the data set to you? Well, you you do the curating, you hit publish, and it's usually a day. Or less. I should, you know, other than also, uh, rather than only introducing Maria, Maria has virtual office hours twice a week. So let's say you you think you've curated your data, you think you feel good about it, but you, you want someone to take another look at it, or you want to, even before you curate it, you want to talk to Maria, ask some questions, we can set up a Zoom call and, and go through it. Uh, so the next question, is there a standard format? So how do you yeah. There's a whole curation guidelines in the user guide side. And, but if you have any questions. There's a light touch set of metadata that's required, and there's a lot of optional um, if you want to do more uh, to it. But, um, but yeah, so it'll, 
force you to do the required stuff. And yeah, we spent a lot of time, and by we I mean Maria, um, our specific schema design um, for this stuff. So, and um, so you know, for the particular categories, they each have different fields. Um, other yeah. supports the smallest set, you know, fit into one of those categories. But you know, on procurement, what is a data set? Um, you know, try to get the terminology right, but there are always ways around it. So yeah, so you run into any trouble. That's why we have the virtual office hours curators. Um, but uh, yeah, I, one thing I do want to emphasize is when you press the publish button, that's sort of you know, there's various are you sure type prompts as you go through that. Right. It's basically an irrevocable action. Um, so I'll go through a couple times <laughs> really quickly, but it is technically an irrevocable <laughs> action. So the uh, um, if that starts the, the process of registering the DOI, copies it into the right. in space to make a you know, an archival version of it. So, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please reach out or come to the right. virtual office. Hour. Better to ask those published. questions before you hit yeah. Right. yeah. Um, There's a lot of published preview stuff you can do to make sure yeah. it looks right. Um, but yeah. Yeah, we'll show you basically exactly what it would look like. Yeah. This will show us so tiny and usable. I was curious if you have any plans to have a similar work session. Ooh, we don't, but I think. Yeah, I think the next step was more sort of a summer boot camp kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, right. Um, maybe the next thing, I don't know about this type of workshop again. There's, depending on your field, there's one every week. Different fields. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's something. Yeah, and, and I think, um, as Dan said, with the summer PI Institute that we're looking at, you know, we could even formalize a couple days of it where the beginning would be more of a workshop where the faculty and students would come, and then, then the students would get to work after that and go back and do mm -hmm. our other job. Just curious, struggle, when you think about these kinds of models and sort of big decisions. If we had just sort of the summer workshop, well, there's several models we've talked about. Um, Attacker and within design safe, right? So if we just had sort of the one week intensive group campaign, it was open to grad students, you had to pay for the travel to send your students here. How many people would want to send grad students that kind of thing? Fair number. Okay. If we did a longer thing where say after the boot camp they could stay and work in small teams with some of our staff for a few more weeks, um it does something to provide office space and all that stuff. How many people would be interested in something like that? Where Still a fair number, not as many. I mean, if we did something joint where you had to come with your students for the first couple of days <laughs> for a workshop like that, and then they stuck around for a little longer, how many people would have interest in something like that? Eight or nine. So, okay. Well, it depends on where you are and probably and how much you know about machine learning. Yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Go ahead. Related to that, are you thinking of hosting this year all this yeah, we'll move them around. We've done workshops other places. So. If it was a work, what's nice I, here? What's nice about doing it here is the staff who have the HPC and the AI experience. So bringing them somewhere else. And the food. And the logistics. food and the, and the people. <laughs> I own the rooms. <laughs> so um, we, we have uh, other training that we provide to that stack that's not design safe branded, but it's you know a, a broad array of trainings that we do. So we have what we call core courses. Um, right now we're um, in the midst of a three-part series with Kara, which is really essentially just parallel programming. Um, and, and that would apply to more than just one Kara too. Um, and, and so uh, yeah. on on tech website and also if you have a tech account, a site account with a tech account, um, we are on our mailing list <laughs> emails from my team that tells you that these short courses are coming up, you can register for them. Those short courses are all free. They're typically two to four hours, sometimes they're all day. Um, and we've got something on containers coming up. We've got something on, um, I think I want an LS Dyna. Uh, LS Dyna? Yep. Yeah. Coming up. So we have a variety of things that we do there. We are already talking about uh, what we did on Monday in the boot camp, doing a short course on that. Um, so, uh, yeah, you want to say something about the summer institutes too. And then the summer institutes, 
So we do have some leaf bomb things that we already do. We do have a machine learning uh, uh, leaf bomb or a summer institute um, that, that we do. Um, we also have the in parallel programming the science on the web for APIs and Python and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of topics. They're not necessarily domain specific. They're not right. 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 specific. Right. So the design safe ones just do not go out of specific add on to that. So, yeah. so once you got, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Email, uh, of, you know, your email's uh, part of that. And when you register for a tax account, you've got your email. Um, you will be getting these notices from us. Um, please don't opt out of those. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. On the site question, mm -hmm. did, yeah, if you would like to post one, maybe reach out. I'm sure. Well, yeah, one other thing we do all of them, but if you have a, a facility we could use, right. somebody to do logistics. Well, one other, other thing that we've out. also discussed is trying to part, partner short courses with, say, the Structured Congress or a different conferences. So bring us to the right conferences. So it's probably the Structured Congress, the Structured People, the GI Congress. I, I'm, there's got to be an equivalent for the Coastal People. There may be multiple. So, if you want to tell us, uh, you know, give us an idea of what what conferences you're going and the best ones it might be to partner with, that would be helpful for us as well. Yeah, Joe. Um, I'm sorry, I don't want to speak to one strict note because it's on a theme, it's more of a data question. Yes. Just to remind everyone that um, part of the Navy Network is the Yes. Uh, and we have all the tools and they're they're totally available to you, but we have different differentiation tools So um, if you are an access to the investigator, um, they're they're there for your use. But if you are a library and you work with investigators and control the different federal uh, we had thirty six mission last year and every mission sometimes people come for training, we want training workshops and we do the summer. And sometimes people come for one on one training and we do the training. Sometimes we video train them on Zoom and ship them the equipment, um, or we can provide staff to train them in the field and we do the equipment. We can work with you in a number of ways. But I also want to say that we've collected a lot of data sets that, uh, that should be on design safe. Now, I don't know uh, actually about their publication status because it's up to the PIs to take that final step to publish these. But, uh, Say that we have hundreds of thousands of screen view images in screen view systems. <laughs> There's a lot of flexibility for AI application there. Uh, and so we have hundreds of thousands of images. We have also a, a, a viewer that sometimes buys Google Sites Street View. And actually, a lot of the Street View data we collected is on Google now. So we can post it to their server. So if you go to Google and look at Bahamas, uh, there's a steer we can use it for you to see if uh, people are acting more well or more far. Uh, but uh, anyway, if you're looking for data sets to play around with, there's a lot of them out there that should be available. I'll just add to that based on the conversation we've had with the as part of the Raptor facility, there is also the RAP, which is an application on your iPad that you can use to build. So there's opportunities to set up questionnaires that would have tags that you might want to use to train your AI tool. So keep that in mind if you're sending out or you're participating in any conference, you can add that to your questionnaire so that people are like using some of that initial tag that you're going to use. Yeah, and the RAP, any questionnaires you fill out, any pictures you take will automatically end up in the Store. Yeah, you you can once you've created a project in Design Safe and you log into RAP, not the RAP, RAP, <laughs> uh, all your projects pop up and you say I want to link to this project and everything on your iPad once once you're connected to Wi-Fi will send not Wi-Fi just internet um, will be sent to that project. And we have them connect questionnaires now shortly, and those are questionnaires like what do these particular questions mean? That will all have to be sent to us. Uh, we'll see what we can do up on the screen. Uh, 
I know the GI has short courses as part of the Congress. Does instructors do that? I mean, so you guys don't have those types of short. We have to organize it ourselves as opposed to propose a short course. Okay, I'm just trying to understand the different institutes are all a little bit different. So the key is we would just kind of piggyback ours. We know where the SEI conference is, and we. Hopefully, can do an email blast, and we'll be at the hotel down down the road the day before, type of thing. Well, again, I, I just want to reiterate, thank you all. Like Dan said, I know it's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort, uh, but this has been very informative for us. And uh, hopefully, you will then go out and tell people in your domains about machine learning, AI, as well as design safe. Uh, and we can continue uh, building on the 